Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I am your host, Aria Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Lauren Euler. Uh, Lauren, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lauren. Uh, I'm a freelance writer uh, for the Times Magazine, LRB, The Baffler a lot, uh, and on Twitter at Lauren Euler. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for coming on. So we're going to be talking about uh, Twitter um, and the meaning of Twitter and what it's doing to our brains, and uh, most specifically a piece that uh, you wrote uh, for The Baffler. Um, we'll link to it below. Uh, the title is Habitual User uh, Tweeting on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. Um, <laughs> and the first line is, what is it about social media that's so depressing? Uh, so what, what what is it? Well, I think what I, the conclusion that I came to was that, like, my social media use, I don't, you know, this is like such an addict thing to say, but like, I'm like, it's not that bad. Like there are people <laughs> who are much <laughs> You can stop at any time. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can, I can delete it. Like if I want to, I just, you know, not, it's just not something I need to do right now. Um, and I think like the structural issues with social media and this sort of like hegemonic, like grip that it has on everyone. And like from a sort of, I don't know. Like if you critique it, if you critique it in terms of like capitalism or something like totally easy to see why it's bad, like the companies are terrible, they're harvesting our data, like whatever, whatever. But like, I'm more interested in the individual experience of it and like what those things do to people that make them sort of like cannibalize each other. Um, my background is sort of in feminism, so I'm very aware of this sort of like intra like group psychologies that make people go crazy and like scream at each other. All the time. Um, and you can just see how social media and I'm like addicted to Twitter. So that's the one that I, that's usually what I'm referring to when I refer to social media. I find like the Facebook critique very boring because it's very obvious why it's bad. And similarly, Instagram, like it's very obvious why it's bad to me. Um, but Twitter has more value than either of those, I think. And that's why it's so like compelling I, to a lot of writers in particular, uh, which is part of what I focused on my piece. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also am like, hate that I'm constantly looking at it and constantly thinking about it and like seeing, having thoughts that are framed in terms of tweets, you know, like yeah, I just definitely. feel like it's like, invading my brain and and there's you know memes on twitter that are like my brain is broken from this website and like (laughs) everybody like everyone feels that way but nobody's like really doing anything about it um and so that was what i was trying to get out with that piece which was hard to write because it was like vaguely personal even though i know a lot of people on twitter feel the same way um but yeah that's basically if that's if, that, if that's an effective summary, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a lot of what you the piece resonated with me. A lot of what you said resonated with me. I found myself, um, you know, in idle moments, I'll have a thought, and it's like, oh, this this would be funny to tweet. But it's also like, did I have this thought because my brain has been primed to want to uh, get the kind of like positive rewards, small though they may be uh, of having a tweet that gets like two retweets and then I, I feel I get like two positive dopamine hits. And is that, is that why I'm having a thought that's like pithy and ironic? Right. Um, right. Yeah. So this thing, like it's, it's inside my brain too and, and inside lots of other people's brains, um, you know, right. Is that not. bad? You know, like what, like if I say something that is valuable and like I came up with it because I've been like trained to think in this way, like that's not necessarily all bad. And I think like part of the reason why I'm still there is that there is a lot of value in, in social media and like being on Twitter and talking to like, there are lots of smart people on it, you know, and like doing these thoughts. And it's just sort of like, it's just like trade off where you're like, Oh yeah, that is a really funny joke. There are people who make jokes that I like think about for like days on Twitter. <laughs> and it's, it's like, um, I don't know. And it, and it's part of this thing that I was thinking about this morning, which is that like people talk so much more now. Like I'm talking to people all the time. Like I'm texting people all the time. Like I woke up at five in the morning today and like my friends in London were like texting me and like my friend in Taiwan was texting me. And you know what I mean? Like I'm just like talking to people all the time. And like, there are lots of good things about that, but it's also seems 
extremely unnatural, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, if you don't want um, solitude, then there's a very simple way to, you know, 30 yeah. years ago, I guess you could turn on the TV or the radio, but that was kind of no, no interactive component. Or then you would have to, if you were totally isolated, you have to go to a bar or the mall or something to interact with people. And, and now you can have um, actual human interaction, even, you know, mediated through this website and text and GIFs and stuff um, uh, whenever, whenever you want it. Um, what, do you, what do you think it is about Twitter that appeals to writers in, in particular? For me, I like to sit at my house all day by myself <laughs> and um, like don't want to do my work. Uh, I do my work like fast in bursts. Like I don't work steadily at all. So I want things to distract myself with. And I definitely think my time would be better spent if I just said, okay, I'm going to read for two hours and then I'm going to not look at the internet and then I'm going to work and then I'm going to stop and do a break. But that's not how work works. And I think part of that piece too has, there's this pressure now to be working all the time, especially if you're a freelancer, especially if you're a writer, like everything, every minute of your life could be spent working in some way because our work is so like, like if I read a book, that's work for me. Um, if I see a movie, that's kind of work for me too. So there's, it's kind of like a way to talk to your co. You know, if you are in an office, you like talk to your coworkers, and it's the same kind of thing. Um, and I like find myself feeling like I need to be keeping up with various conversations um, as part of my work. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Uh, it's probably convenient that I think that, but <laughs> then you see things, I mean, you just see the pe way people are, people are just like crazy and it's like, makes you feel crazy. Cause you're like, D is, are people like out there thinking this? And so then you go on Twitter and like, there are people who are like, these people are crazy. And you're like, okay, it's fine. It's fine. Like I'm not the only one, you know what I mean? Um, so I think that's the reason, but I also think that I at least, uh, find myself very drawn to seeing how crazy people can be when they are um, subject to all of these inputs in this like technological psychological realm. Like they get in there and you can just tell, like you can just tell why people are doing certain things and like why they do the pile ons and like why they insult people and why they're subtweeting and like who they're subtweeting and like why they're doing it. And it's just so, it just reminds me so much of high school and like so much of like stupid girl shit. That <laughs> and I'm always like, wow, they're really doing that. And they're like, it's just amazing to me that people will do it in public where everyone can see. So that is also compelling to me. I have to be honest, just like the observational appeal. Um, and, I don't know what I do with that, <laughs> but, but it is interesting. Um, why do you think, do you think it was just an accident of history that t Twitter was a thing that attracted these people versus like Facebook or Instagram or MySpace or Friendster or whatever, or, or is there something particular to the way the service works that en encourages this type of, you know, uh, hyper literate uh, reading type person to want to invest time in this strange platform yeah i think well i think like facebook is a total failure there's just the you the what's it's like an there's like an old tw tweet about this that's like facebook is like all these people you know and hate and twitter is all these people you don't know and like right like because you can like curate it in a way and like it's acceptable to be to follow people on twitter that you don't know like we've right. followed each other for such a long time we like don't know each other at all um and uh like make weird friendships that way uh that to me are like somewhat dissatisfying but also very nice to have like I have lots of friends that I talk to several times a week that I barely see in person that I met on Twitter um and so Facebook's terrible Instagram is like so boring like nobody takes good pictures right <laughs> um and also if you take a picture you look at it and you're like okay I'm done there's no way to like the way that the interface works you can't link easily to things and you can't like have a conversation back and forth really rapidly. Whereas the Twitter interface 
Oh, I don't even know if interfaces. I'm not like a, I'm, I'm not like a tech person, so I'm not might not be using the right vocabulary. But like the way Twitter works, it's very easy to have conversations and multiple conversations in this, at the same time, like in different registers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that helps a lot. But I did take it off my phone. So oh really? <laughs> yes, yes. I kept the only one I have on my phone is Instagram because it's so boring that like I don't I can't look at it for more than five minutes it's done but i'm sure other people have problems with instagram so. <laughs> yeah there's I people who fall in. I, I think don't I, feel like credit you know i think people talk more about like falling into an instagram hole than falling into a um a twitter hole um i don't know there's, there's something i mean with instagram it's a lot more passive um because mm-hmm. it's not like you i mean you can comment but you can't just like take a reply photo and send it to someone or something whereas twitter you can say um yeah. lol or go fuck yourself or whatever you want to whoever you want yeah. in the world yeah and it moves much faster so like you feel really active even if you're i mean i know a lot of people who just look at it and they don't have like they don't comment on anything or talk but even so i think like it's much more engaging to see people like having a conversation live and like talking about things live and you do have this sense of like Anything could happen, like, at any moment, and then Twitter, because also that's where the news is, right? I mean, maybe people get their news on Facebook, but the way that t- it just seems more... Well, yeah, like, like news, news breaks stuff. on Twitter, um, yeah. but I think more normal people get their news via Facebook than get their news on Twitter, because there's, oh, yeah. there's a lot more people on Facebook to begin with, yeah. and, yeah, and, and you need to... It's, like, a more... Pat, you, you can have a more passive experience on Facebook and like get things shown to you than, than on Twitter. Yeah. And also, I mean, I used to work at Vice and like nobody, came, the only thing that mattered was the Facebook post. Like no one cared about what, how you tweeted the article, like the article going on Twitter, like the writers would care because like the other writers and the other people in media would be like tweeting it or whatever. And I always like cared more about the t- Twitter response than the Facebook response. But like as a traffic driver, it doesn't matter. And so it does feel to a certain extent like embarrassing to be like, oh, I spent all my time on this social media network that matters the least in terms of like the grand population. Um, but whatever I, here I am. <laughs> here yeah. I am. Yeah. It's, it's where the, it, it's, it's both the elite. It's where the elite things happen and where the elite people are. I mean, the president of the United States is there and spends a lot of time there and he using that platform helped him a lot. Um, in getting to the presidency. Um, but it's like the less popular one and yeah, it drives less traffic. Um, you know, Facebook is, you know, over a billion people and Twitter is like supposedly 200, 300 million, but probably is like one tenth of that are actually active users. So it it just, I, I, it's weird. It's just a weird state of affairs that there's this bifurcation between the unpopular elite thing and the, you know, uh, popular <laughs> the thing the 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 normies use um with yeah. facebook <laughs> i mean there's a lot of normies on twitter uh but it's like it's it's just an it's like much more of an opt-in thing right and there are so many platforms now i mean maybe this has changed but there's so many other things that you can't really use if you don't have a facebook account right or like it used to, it used to be hard to do Spotify unless you had a Facebook account, and now I think maybe that's not true. I don't know. I don't. I mean, I have a Facebook just because, like, I'm like, I don't care anymore. Sometimes I find apartment sublets on it, <laughs> right? Right? Like that's what I do. Yeah. Um, if you if you at this point, if you speak English and you don't have a Facebook page, you've made like a conscious choice not to do that. Whereas with yeah. Twitter, you can be like, oh, I don't even really understand what that is, and be a totally normal person. Yeah, and it's like a world. I mean, like, as I get more followers and, like, sometimes I'll meet people who, like, like I'll tweet something that's very Twitter con- context, nest, like, essential, right? Like, you need to know I'm, t- I'm per- participating in a conversation but making a very specific point within the conversation and, like, but kind of purposefully not explaining myself because I understand that some people who follow me will know what I'm talking about. But then I find that I, like, talk to other people outside of the realm of this, like, like clickish. It's not It's not a click because nobody likes each other, but, like, <laughs> like, a, <laughs> like, a, like a weird 
ecosystem thing and then people will be like I have no idea what you're talking about that was so weird and I'm like oh embarrassing sorry because you don't want to be like oh you wouldn't get it because it's a <laughs> like you wouldn't get it it's for Twitter people that's like the most embarrassing <laughs> thing ever um, yeah and you're trying to explain a, f- a funny Twitter thing to someone who's not on Twitter is like uh, usually it, it doesn't you know the humor doesn't exactly translate yeah, and I try to think of it as, like, a hobby, but that sucks. Like, I should definitely learn to knit or something or, like, cook. Like, I don't cook. I can just start baking. <laughs> but I'm, like, listening to podcasts, but I don't know. <laughs> this is where we are. Um, can you, can you, you wrote a little, bit, a little bit in the piece about uh, real versus fake on social media, whether what happens, if something happened on Twitter, did it really happen? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think what I was thinking about are people who have personas and like the personas make them just seem abhorrent. And I know, like, do you want to name any names? <laughs> no, like, I absolutely <laughs> do not. But they definitely just suck. And, 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 uh, you know, like, if you met them in person, you would they would be totally nice and normal and you could probably like have a beer and it would be cool and maybe you'd be friends. But at this point, like knowing that they channel this aspect of their personality in this way, in this public way, and they're either not thinking it, that everybody's reading it, which I think is stupid. Like that's a total lack of self-awareness or like that they don't care. <laughs> and these, that that's just, you're like, I don't, I can't like what? And that's another thing where you're like very sort of drawn. Like I'm like sucked in. I'm like, I can't believe this person is like talking like this and saying these things in front of all these people, like people who can employ them, like people they might want to date. Like, you know, people are not thinking about who's reading and a lot of people are reading or could be reading. Um, so, and I think that what justifies that for people is that they think it's like, it's just Twitter. It's not real something that goes into that is the idea that Twitter is like not really this important social network. It's like the one that like, it's the niche one. Um, another thing is like, it's just online in general. And a lot of people are not used to thinking of things that happen online as happening in real life. Um, and, but obviously it's the same. It's just a, it's just a sphere of life, right? Like it's no different to, if you were something happens at work or something happens in your love life or whatever, it's just like a part of your life. Um, and I think that people use that to sort of justify, um, channeling their worst impulses. They're sort of like jealousy and their like resentment and their like, like snap judgment making stuff, uh, into the way they act on Twitter. So I think that's what I meant. And also I think, no, that's all. That's all I meant. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I don't, I'm right, trying to wrap my head around, around this distinction constantly. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned that uh, you saw a tweet in which someone said that you, Lauren should kill yourself or die or something. And then some, and then an acquaintance of yours liked that tweet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I, it, it wasn't my name. It was like someone who could only be me, right? Um, the, they use a series of identifiers that like most people, like most the general population would have no idea it was me, but like people who know me um, in a professional way and, and in a personal way definitely would be able to tell it was me. And I didn't see it. I saw it because someone was like, hey, this, this girl that you've never met said this about you. And I was like, cool. And then I looked at the people who liked it. And I was like, what the fuck, you know? Um, and like, it's just, it's just so, it's just so lame. It's just really lame. And I try really hard now, like not to subtweet specifically. Like I said, I will t- say something like very general about a tendency that I think is bad, but I like try really hard not to subtweet. I try like actually not to criticize article like pieces of writing even anymore or like books even anymore um because I think that it is like damaging (laughs) to everyone (laughs) um but it does encourage that attitude totally uh but yeah that was just such a bummer and it was like you know we weren't close friends but like we're kind of friends um and like maybe something I'd said on Twitter had made her feel like we weren't friends. And then she felt like, you know, 
totally able, like, who cares? And also probably, like, why would I see that? I don't know. Everyone sees everything. I, this is what I'm learning. Like, people are huge stalkers, and, like, if it's out there, people want to read it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, the I mean, the, the type of behavior that uh, the Internet, social media, Twitter in particular, encourages um, seems to be a net negative for humanity. I mean, you know, how often in real life do you go up to someone you don't know and say, like, go fuck yourself, or I hope you die, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, whereas... <laughs> If you express something controversial on Twitter and you have any kind of prominence or you're just a normal piece per- person and a prominent person retweets it, suddenly you're going to get like, you know, I'm going to stab you in the face. And Yeah, know. yeah. It's like, it's very strange. There's a comment on my on my article. Someone tweeted a comment to it. One of the Baffler tweets about it was like, if you're a bad person on Twitter, then you're a bad person in real life. Um. And this guy replied to it that was like, no way, I'm a troll on Twitter so that I can like channel my rage and insecurity so that I don't like shoot up a shoot up at Walmart or something. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's just like dial it back <laughs> a little bit. Little, let's unpack what's happening here. This is a person who follows the baffler and a leftist intellectual magazine on Twitter. <laughs> who is replying to this tweet saying that they have, they need to be rude to strangers on the internet under the guise of anonymity of an ironic avatar so that they don't kill a bunch of people (laughs) like this. There's like so many problems with America (laughs) that are just like in this one (laughs) little thing. Um, But also I think, that like the stakes of the discourse on Twitter are so skewed and like really fucked up. So everybody thinks that everything everyone says is like very personal and also like indicative of some grand trend in ideology or something. Yeah. People feel like like, it's a fight to the death every single day. Yeah. And it's like, I need to come out victorious. Like I am like the crusader for the right, like, like, justice like it's all about fucking justice and it's like you're not a politician you're like some you're like a 28 year old girl like in your apartment in Brooklyn like what do you (laughs) you know what I mean like what do you think and also most people are just either preaching to the choir or like totally like going for like their opposite enemies who are never gonna listen to them anyway and especially not on Twitter um so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's also that's why people get so mad about like New York Times op eds because it's like you're used. There's this idea of the platform as being sort of like so powerful, and it's because people are desperate to have like platforms and like be able to like disseminate their message to everyone because that's what we've been taught by social media is like you can like tell people things and they might listen to you. Well, I think I think yeah, it's it's interesting how the um the New York Times op-ed page has its, its importance in people's minds has grown in the past, like just a couple of years. I, maybe it's because now anyone can pop off about anything like anywhere they want. And then there's only like one arena that everyone has decided is the important arena for opinion and writing in the nation. Like Washington Post op- op-ed page, Wall Street Journal op-ed page doesn't really matter. You know, LA Times don't even know what that is. Anything else in the New York Times doesn't <laughs> matter either. Like they have like this whole other newspaper. But if that, David like, Brooks writes <laughs> writes about taking one of his friends to lunch and her not understanding the Italian sandwiches, then like that's <laughs> that's like a huge cultural event. Yeah, and, I do think that they should fact check it. Like they don't fact check it, which is annoying. Um, but like. This, the like part of the reason people pay attention to it is because it causes all this like drama on Twitter and like all these people like get bent out of shape about whatever. I think that the David Brooks columns are fun. Like some of that is fun. Like the sandwich thing, no harm in and having like a long, <laughs> a long conversation about that. Yeah. But like, like the the ideological furor that always happens is like totally tone deaf and also reveals like people should be getting mad about what's on like Fox news, you know, but it's kind of hard to get mad about that for some reason. 
because everybody knows that it's going to be wrong. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I think pro- probably one aspect of it is people and writers in particular on Twitter are thinking that they were the real ones who deserve to write a column <laughs> or at least a one-off op-ed Listen, in the they, New York times. Those columns don't even pay very much. <laughs> like <laughs> they don't even fact check you. Like you don't want to write there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's that, but yeah, I think it is like, it's, it's seen as the final place where like some, some person who matters has chosen and said, this is the thing that matters as opposed to like the, the, um, collective of Twitter, like giving something a thousand retweets or, you know, the Google algorithm deciding this is, you know, the thing that's, that's most linked. So it's like the last, (laughs) last part of human, you know, like human judgment that we haven't handed over to the machines or to the mob. And then that's why people really feel like it's it's uh, the most important thing uh, every day and really care also, about people like Barry Weiss. Yeah, well, people also don't understand that, like, sometimes magazines publish things that everyone at the magazine doesn't really agree with. But, like, they're publishing it as a presentation of something. There's this very patronizing strand of commentary now that's like, I don't agree with this and I understand what's wrong with it. But all these plebs out there are reading it <laughs> like... And, like, just absorbing all of this, like, horrible information. And, like, they're going to, like, turn into zombies uh, for the other side. And we're going to have, like, you know, full-on, like, like war. I don't know. You know, people – it's this very, like, protective, patronizing, condescending thing that's, like, people can't read. And, like, look, I'm from West Virginia. I totally get that people can't read. (laughs) (laughs) But, like – uh, it doesn't seem that this is the way to accomplish any sort of goal, <laughs> right? It's just like a way to waste your afternoon and get mad. And then you go to drinks with people and they're like, why are you so like twitchy and crazy? And you're like, I was fighting with people on the internet all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, maybe this will be the last Twitter question before we move on to the other essay we're gonna, of yours that we're going to discuss. Um, so I... Um, you know, started following you at some point. I didn't know who you were. I just thought, oh, this person has funny tweets. Um, do you do you feel like you're you're performing on there? Is it a persona? Do you feel like this is an honest like channeling of who you actually <laughs> are, or is this like kind I of think, a character you're playing? Uh, I think like it's a. I do. People do say like, oh, you're just like your Twitter more than I think other people are, but I try, like, I definitely do things sometimes in a character or, like, sometimes, like, saying, channeling a, a, a mode of, ta- like, speech that I wouldn't use in real life, but I'm a writer. I write fiction as well, and I find that, like, the the fic like writing in a fictional voice is very similar to doing like Twitter stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's fun. And I don't know that like people think, I think that they know, and this is just something that everyone should be aware of, which is like people will see your social media and then think like, Oh, that's who that person is. So, it it becomes a barrier to like forming valuable, new valuable relationships when someone meets you on Twitter and then you like have to be like, Oh no, I have this whole other, all this other stuff in my life and like all these other thoughts and like all these other like things that I do that you just, I just like don't tweet about them, but people want to think it's the same way. Like if you read a novel and like you, if, if you're a good reader of novels, you, understand that other things are happening or if the novelist is good they like create a sense of like an outside world that's not happening in the novel like they're suggesting like it's open but um i don't think that twitter is the best medium (laughs) for creating that sense of like a full character right Mm -hmm. does that make sense (laughs) yeah yeah so maybe it's the the who was it who had the famous uh split between the the flat characters and the round characters. So it was like oh, Auden, yeah. Auden or something. A- anyway, yeah, it's more of a... It's, it's a know. flat character platform, which <laughs> yeah, is exactly. fine. It's fine. It just, like, does create weird things in, in real life, right? Like, um, and I think kind of, like, t- people who are famous on Twitter have 
awkward problems when they do like online dating and things like that, <laughs> which I don't do. But um, it it uh, it is it is like just awkward, I think. And I do try to make sure that I don't tweet things that make me look bad, <laughs> right? Like I try not to tweet things that make me look like jealous or petty or um, all my bad impulses that I have. I just try to express them in private <laughs> <laughs> towards my loved ones. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, it's gotten like the the people who I follow on Twitter most closely. I've realized I can um, I can predict um, their retweets. Like I see a tweet, I'm like, oh, I bet so and so retweeted this because that's their hobby horse, or they like this kind of stuff, or they're always you know they're always doing that. And yeah, so it is kind of like you know people. Most people are not like one note; <laughs> they contain m- multitudes. But the yeah the platform like flattens them out, so we're like. Oh, that's the person who's always on about you know X Y Z and right. And I think it's also like inherently competitive platform because you're always sort of like, how many followers does that person have? Like, how is their tweet doing well? Like, it even if you don't act actually really care that much, like you do sort of like it encourages you to like rank yourself among all these other people. So then yeah, you, you have do, a, you see your follower. You want to see them as a flat character. Like you want to be like that's their thing and that's all that they do, right? And it's, it's just, like, it's similar to the, the personal brand conversation, which, like, everybody understands and understands is bad and still. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's like, well, that person has 10,000 followers because we know what their shtick is. It's like, oh, she's, yeah. she's like the cynical drunk person. Yeah, at her. yeah. She's like a sad, <laughs> sad art girl. Like, what, are, you know. Oh. <laughs> it's just a bummer. It's just such a bummer. Um. Was there a breaking point that made you take it off your phone as a as opposed to um, just watching it on or just looking well, at your computer? Well, in July, I wrote a bunch of pieces. I wrote like three pieces where the basic gist of them was like the internet's bad and ruining your life. Um, and <laughs> that was like a physician heal thyself kind of a moment. Yeah, and I was like, I should get off this, and also it like takes up a lot of time when you're you could be reading two page like re- I could read an article or like I could be doing this on the subway and instead you just look at your stats right and I just don't want to be looking at my stats all the time that's why I think it's good I haven't had Facebook on my phone for a long time um but I remember when I deleted my Facebook for a while I got all these emails that were like how am I going to contact you and I was like the way you're contacting me now, <laughs> like a lot of my email. Uh, do you want my phone number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's good. Yeah, I, I actually um, I deleted uh, within the past like six months. First, I deleted Snapchat, and then I deleted Facebook and Facebook Messenger from my phone. And uh, it was definitely an alloy, unalloyed positive thing. I, I don't think there's been a, a single negative, yeah. single, single downside to it. Uh, I don't think I'm quite ready to delete <laughs> Twitter from, from the phone. Um, there are people I talk to often uh, on, on direct messages and stuff. So um, Yeah, but that. I wish that they would just text me or like email me. I'm like, we don't need to be damning. Why don't we just have a different internet relationship <laughs> that's like more healthy, but they like can't. Like, there's one person that I hang out with. We hang out maybe, like, every six months or something. And I'll be like, okay, I'm going to the party, but text me so that I'll tell you when I get there. And he's like, ha, ha, K, and then, like, does it and then still DMs me on Twitter. And I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to DM me on Twitter, I can't tell you when I get to the party because uh, you won't put my number in your phone for some reason. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Okay, let's let's – and our Twitter, the Twitter portion of our conversation. Talk about it forever. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and Endless. let's um, move to a piece that you wrote that ran in the New York Times Magazine last week, I think. Um, mm-hmm. When the headline is "When did everything get so toxic?" and "toxic" is in quotes. Um, what what inspired you to to want to write about the subject? Um. So I noticed toxic. The word toxic a lot. Uh, Also just background in case people don't know, this is for a column that the times magazine runs weekly where people sort of riff for like 1300, 1400 words about um, a word being used and how it's sort of been changed. Usually, but it's usually like an internet kind of word. Um, 
And I know, I mean, I've noticed Toxic a lot working uh, for a women's website. I worked at Broadly, the Vice website, uh, because people are always doing advice columns about like getting rid of your toxic boyfriends or your toxic friend is like ruining your life or your toxic boss is like causing you stress at home. Um, And it's like a very easy sort of metaphor to understand like how thing, the way that you act might not be your fault or like entirely your fault. Like you might be influenced by all these outside forces that are then going to like contaminate you. But recently, and I think that it's it's like very clearly from the sort of proliferation of toxic masculinity as a concept, it shows up everywhere. Like it shows up in politics articles, like it shows up in all sort of like social justice language. And, and it's just like a really really easy shorthand to like say something is like threateningly bad right and it's also functions in this way where everybody is sort of trying to like figure out what is the big structural issue that we have there's this like weird like frenzy almost to say like this is the problem and like this is what's causing it and I am the person who has pinpointed the solution right um and so I think that's what like toxic is very useful word for that um project which is well-intentioned sort of but ultimately i think um short-sighted and a little bit like insufficient to the task of true social critique (laughs) Mm -hmm. or just representing reality in general yeah um so I mean, probably someone tweets about toxic masculinity like every 30 seconds um, oh. and you can see it constantly. It's like, it's really become like a mainstream term at this point. Um, you know, Brett Kavanaugh was, uh, was referenced or toxic masculinity was referenced in terms of Brett Kavanaugh and he, what he may or may not have done in high school and college. Um, and I mean, one, one interesting thing you note about the word is that like um, toxic, you, in, in maybe in its original sense had to do with like um, concentration or dosage mm-hmm. and something can be uh, safe in a small amount, but toxic in a uh, larger amount, including water yeah. can be toxic. If you drink too much water and perhaps any substance, if you have too much of it would be toxic yeah. in some way um, that I don't know, that seems to have been lost when people started using this word because it's not like, you have like a smidge of toxic masculinity or like your masculinity is like a little below tos- toxic and then it like crosses over the boundary into toxic. Yeah. It was more like there's this one kind of masculinity that is always negative. That's always bad. Yeah. And I think that like, that's a really, this is, I mean that, so the, the phrase toxic masculinity, which I talked about in the piece, which I thought was really interesting when I was researching it comes from this sort of like new age, like it's not there not all of them are sort of proto MRA type kind of guys, but they're really sort of like back to the land. Like we need to reclaim masculinity for men and like reassert the value of manhood. This was in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and the right, poet, so you, yeah, you call yeah. this the mythopoetic men's movement. Yeah. The mythopoetic. So is this like the guys who they used to make fun of as like sitting around in a circle and like beating drums? Yes. And like also doing like, <clears throat> like real, like, it, it was about like st- strength and like the like men needed to stop being passive and and all kinds of stuff like this and like some of it you know i do think that men <laughs> men are feeling bad right now and like feeling bad about this conversation and i don't think that number one it's like politically uh, viable to keep making men feel bad <laughs> like this. Uh, and number two, I like if you're a heterosexual woman, it's not like um, a good strategy for your personal relationships to constantly be talking about I, like men being bad. I don't know. <laughs> well, just throwing it out there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure there are guys out there who want to hear about how bad they are and yeah, it's just, like, not healthy, though, and I think it's sort, sort of, like, a misunderstanding of people, all the, all these people are, like, desperate to be making sort of structural critiques that um, are not, are very short-sighted, like, they don't understand how all these things are related and sort of, like, in this sort of, like, muddled, like, horrible thing where you're, like, well, 
he might be acting this way for this reason. So that's why I'm going to, that's what I'm going to blame. But actually that's not how humans work. Um, anyway, toxic masculinity. Yeah. A sort of like catch all for anything bad that a man does like mass shootings, like David Foster Wallace fans, like, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, it's just this thing where you can like have this like really minor cultural thing that you find annoying as well as this like huge political problem that like kills people and like they're blaming it on the same thing which just doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense Uh, it it almost (laughs) the way you're describing it almost reminds me of the way some people talk about uh whiteness as being this kind of um yeah almost magical like force that um you know pervades our society and can't ever be defeated. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about like eldritch energy of whiteness or something along those lines. So yeah. So this is like the gender version of that, of like this amorphous evil that's floating out there. Yeah. And like you can be infected by it. And then the only men who are not are sort of like the ones who are like tweeting about male feminism or like, you know, like tweeting like male feminists, like ally, whatever, let women speak and, and, stuff like that i don't know and and they feel like they can't using the, talk. Hand, the hands clapping emoji yeah, the hand clapping thing they feel like they can't talk and like any work that they do is going to be minor and like they it's just it's just like it's just dumb it's just dumb but but like it's also real like i definitely think that there is like a, a like truth in it like there are certain parts of masculinity just as there are certain parts of femininity that are harmful and like make people crazy and make them act in certain ways towards other people that they, they probably regret and are not um, good. And I think like as a governing force of our society, it does, it, it is partially true, but I think what annoys me about it is that, um, People are like, well, that's the one problem. And if we solve that, then it's fine. And it's like, that's not really how it works. Especially, and especially for people who are, sorry, there's a truck. That's okay. It's leaving. Okay. There's a truck. Uh, for people who, who all, who are always sort of like talking about intersectionality, they're not really thinking about it in terms of like their enemies. They're just thinking about it in terms of like, this, the structural forces that are, are causing, um, like, uh, they're not thinking about it in terms of privileges. They're thinking about it in terms of the opposite of privilege disadvantages. Mm-hmm. Um, when, you know, if Brett Kavanaugh is acting on toxic masculinity, he's also acting like as a result of his class position and also as a result of his race and also as a result of like his being a terrible person. Right. <laughs> like, there are lots of people who have all the same inputs who do not act like that. Right. Um, he seems to be an alcoholic, like, (laughs) like that, that is like a contributing factor to the way that he is. Um, and not to be like, this is why it's valuable to read novels again, but like, this is why it's valuable to read novels because they don't make you say like, this guy is acting this way for these like three psychological reasons. And then we are going to explain why that is. Uh, yeah, th- yeah, that, that, that was Sorry, really... that was like ranting. No, no, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, uh, there's a erasing of human complexity that's <laughs> happening on, uh, on both sides and social media enables it because if you have 280 characters to describe someone, um, you pretty much can describe them as good or bad. Um, yes. And, and actually, it makes, there, it sorry, makes go ahead. people seem sort of like prophetic, like they're like, I know the true, I can see, I can see all the machinations and like, I can identify them. And like, I am the person who I'm the whistle, like the weird whistleblower or something, you know? Um, and, and in that way, it's also kind of fun to watch. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so there's a, uh, there's a think piece that I want to write, but I've been too lazy to write about this general subject about, uh, good, versus bad on social media and how some people are good and some people are bad. And it used to be that people would say about the writer Jeet here, um, oh, Jeet is good now. And then he would tweet something else and they'd say, oh, Jeet is bad now. Um, And this is just the stupidest way to view human behavior is, uh, you know, the two categories, good and bad, and everyone uh, fits in them. And maybe you can flip in between them, depending on the last thing you you said. Um, 
so yeah, there, there's a lot here. Um, but I want to ask you about one other uh, area of life that has been labeled toxic very often, which is toxic fandom. Oh, I don't know that much about that. Thank God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do think that like a lot, I think that it seems to me that most people who participate in toxic fandom are uh, children, right? Mm-hmm. Like they are teenagers, possibly even younger than teenagers, possibly like board college students. I don't know if this is true. I mean, certainly there are like guys online doing this kind of thing, but a lot of it, especially if you talk about like Nicki Minaj or Beyonce, you know, people don't say Beyonce has a toxic, toxic fan base, but she definitely does like under the definition of the term. Yeah. Um, and, or like Taylor Swift or any of these or the star Wars people. I think that maybe is an older toxic fan base. I don't know. Um, but it's all this sort of, it's all enabled by social media, obviously, because you can sort of seed some kind of like, uh, like complaint that then all these other people latch onto and like promote very quickly. And is do you say that the celebrity or the artistic product is responsible for that? Not necessarily. It's strange because sometimes people will say like Kim Kardashian is toxic because then she's promoting these ideas, but like they won't necessarily say that like star Wars itself is toxic, even though like without star Wars, they wouldn't have this toxic fan Mm -hmm. base. Um, So, is I, is it a problem I know how to solve? No, I think that they should just get rid of the internet. Like, really <laughs> cancel it. like if, if anything's getting canceled, like it should be the whole project. Um, I, I'm fine. I think we like had a good run. We saw what it was and like most of the archives are digitized now. So like we can keep that and like, you just have to do it. Like you're going to go to the library. Cool. <laughs> take it out I mean, on like a three by five floppy yeah, disk like, and bring it home yeah it's just causing like way more problems than it's solving <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that's a radical solution to the pro- problems of our times i mean if there wasn't the internet there there probably wouldn't be donald trump so that that has you know uh, president donald trump at least so that has that going but, for it but his, but his tweets are interesting like i don't know how powerful they are do you know what i mean like i don't like obviously lots of people are reading them and then they get reported and like if he didn't have twitter as his like megaphone how, would he have something else i don't i did, probably... yeah i've thought about that too i mean it's you know it's weird because he um you know like it would make more sense for the president who often has announcements to make that are longer than 280 characters to do them either on Facebook or his own white house website. And instead Mm -hmm. he goes, um, he goes on Twitter because his brain is even more broken than everyone else on Twitter. Um, so yeah, the question of whether Trump like absent Twitter, does Trump rise or what exact power, um, Twitter gave Trump. I mean, the fact that every journalist in America is on Twitter and monitoring it constantly certainly helped, um, Trump's, you know, Twitter uh, habit, uh, you know, launch him like further into um, notoriety. And he certainly is more effective at using it than like most other political figures. Um, just briefly on the, on the toxic fandom bit, I think it's, I was, I was wondering like, you know, occasionally you see these articles and it's like the dark heart of the trombone enthusiast community. You know, it's like there there was like some scandal within it, and then like everyone took sides, and like friendships were broken, and marriages fell apart, <laughs> and it's just like is does 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 every like online community like, there's something be, uh, there's something about the combination of the power of, of online connection with uh, people's like strongly held interests that when you combine them, it encourages bad behavior, and. Um, yes. And there's some cor- some sort of like entropy like decay in like the moral fiber of of the group. So like, so like yeah. I was when I was a kid in the um, mid and late '90s, like I was like, really into comic books and I was like on a comic book message board and like it never became toxic. Like there were flame like flame wars and stuff and people arguing, but it, it never it never like no one ever like started talking about like uh, you know race hatred or, or anything like that. 
there are like murder. You know, we're going to go murder the, uh, the comic book creators because we didn't like the uh, the latest issue. But it seems like just a, like the, there has been some sort of world generation um, that maybe is <laughs> natural uh, to the way these things work. Where like the people who are good and not you know, I'm, now I'm making a mistake of saying certain people are good and certain people are bad. The people who do not want to fantasize about murdering. Um, you know, the creator of Rick and Morty, um, they, they go do something else with their lives and maybe they get involved in baking or whatever. Whereas the people who are, um, who really enjoy fantasizing about killing the creator of Rick and Morty, they stick around and these people reinforce each other. And then it becomes, (laughs) becomes a toxic fandom. Like, I don't like, I love Star Wars. I don't think Star Wars is toxic. Um, but obviously there's something there that attracted the type of person who, uh, got really, really mad that like an Asian American woman was in the new movie or something along those lines. Uh, I don't know. And then, you know, enough to send this um, woman death threats. So, so I, 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 throw, <laughs> I, I throw up my hands, I guess. Isn't it just, I don't know. I mean, it's like a proprietary thing. Like everyone's like, that's my thing. You can't have it. And I think the part of social media that really encourages it is like this like personal branding thing where everybody's encouraged to like have a thing and like be unique and use it in order to like gain notoriety and like fame or whatever. And I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know what people think that their end goal is. Like, do people want to be famous like that? Because you don't get rich doing that, really. I mean, maybe people think that you do, but like, I mean, like, well, you get social affirmation, right? Like, just like it's just there's not there's no end game. It's just kind of like a daily churn of like, will I get more followers today? And like, will I get my like dopamine? And then I like need more. And then like I'm like pressing the button and. And, and so I think like if people are like my, my thing is being polluted, then I need to like stick up for it. And then maybe I will get more attention or something like that. Also, they probably like don't have people that they can talk to about these things in their lives, which, Mm -hmm. which would be helpful. And like, also we probably need better mental health infrastructure in this country and like (laughs) help, help any, all of our health care is really fucked. Uh, and um, every, uh, the, the computer is bad. Like, <laughs> like, like if, if the only anyway, the internet's bad. T- TLDR. Uh, <laughs> like you, if you, the only people that you can talk to are like crazy people on the internet, then you are probably at risk of becoming a crazy person on the internet. Uh, <laughs> um. So. It's not funny. It's like a big problem. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Uh, maybe you know. There's this. Uh, we had a, a guest on the site, uh, Adam Frank, who's an astrophysicist, actually at University of Rochester, um, where I am in Rochester, New York, and he wrote this book about like, um, is it maybe the the reason we haven't uh, no aliens have come and visited our planet is that every planet eventually. Um, just because of the laws of physics has to deal with climate change and uh, most of them fail to deal with it and the civilization dies out. Um, I thought this was a really interesting idea, but I thought maybe the, I can't remember if you called it the civilizational test or something, planetary test, maybe it's social media, like maybe being connected, having the ability to hear from any person on the globe um, and have them argue with each other. uh, Maybe that is like the, test that we need like moral growth in order in order to over, overcome because it, this is like not a not a natural uh, situation for humans and it's very new and very strange and we're right. not doing a great job right now uh figuring out how to deal with it no no not at all it's like people are people's brains are not ready for it and they can't handle it but i think there's some people like i used to joke with my friends that we were social media accelerationists that like we just like want <laughs> to like go, go faster and faster, which it kind of is going faster and faster, like rapidly, rapidly getting worse. I've been on Twitter since like 2009. You mean to bring, you want to bring on the collapse in order to like, yeah, endorse. yeah. Just get, get rid of it somehow. <laughs> like, I don't know how we could do that, but maybe, maybe it'll happen. I mean, maybe, the, Twitter, maybe Twitter will just go bankrupt. That would be, that would be the most logical solution. Yeah, when, when would Facebook just buy it? Um, I mean, maybe there, maybe there would be an antitrust uh, <laughs> objection to that. Maybe the government would decide, especially if it's the Trump's government, that Twitter is like a natural, you know, a national uh, resource that we need to preserve. Like it would be like, you know, Delta Airlines going out of business. Like we need to, so then the government will take it over. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe we can't just have a, an easy an easy out like that. Um, 
Okay, so all of our viewers and listeners, after you stop listening to this, you can um, smash your phone on the ground or throw your computer into a giant pit. And um, uh, But before you do that, um, follow Lauren Euler on Twitter so she gets one more follower. <laughs> She's very entertaining. Um, and is there, where else can people find your stuff if they want to look for it? Mm, I think probably Twitter is like where I'm t- putting it all. I have a little website, like a Tumblr. Yeah, that's what I got to do. If I were really serious, I would just get a website. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I write for the I write for the Baffler most often. So you can find me there. Cool. Um, so uh, thanks so, so much, Lauren, for coming on. Thanks to all of our viewers and listeners. And we'll see you again next time. Thanks. Bye.